Welcome back to Book View Now, our coverage of the National Book Festival here in Washington, D.C. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour. Now we are going into a, a, a different world altogether. The book is All the Birds in the Sky. Author Charlie Jane Anders, welcome to you. It's so great to be here. So let me ask you about the idea for the book, and we'll kind of introduce our listeners to what this, what you're doing here. Right. Because you're taking us into different worlds. Yeah, and basically it's a kind of a combination of fantasy and science fiction. I've always been fascinated by the way that different genres work and how they set up different expectations. And mm -hmm. so for this, I had this idea of a story about a witch and a mad scientist and their relationship and how they get to know each other and, mm -hmm. and their different perspectives on the world. And it kind of started out as a zany cartoony thing in my head of like- A zany cartoony thing? Yeah. Me meaning um, what? <laughs> <laughs> meaning like that there'd be like these two stock characters, like a witch who's, you know, who's got a coven and like a spell book and a wand and, you know, fighting against a mad scientist who's got like a flying car and a ray yeah. gun and like, you know, a robot sidekick and all that stuff. And uh -huh. just kind of very silly and zany. And and over time it turned into more of a relationship story about like how they, it, they became more kind of grounded characters in with like roots in hopefully real life. And it was more about how they approach the world differently and, and how that shapes the way that they interact. And well, so you bring, so we have Patricia Delphine, who we meet as a young girl, speaks to birds, yes. right? Yes. In the first scene when we first meet her. Right. And then we have Lawrence Armstead, as a young boy who's who makes a time machine. Yeah, right? he, he builds a, a yeah. time machine on his wrist. Uh, yeah, but only one that slips time a couple of seconds. <laughs> That's right. I like that, yeah. yeah. It's it's almost useless. It's just, it's almost useless. It's almost useless, but it makes a big difference two seconds. Huh? Yeah, it can sometimes. And you know, that's, that's kind of the thing is like when I wanted it to be a thing where they kind of know who they are, but they don't, they don't have a lot of power, especially when we first meet them. It's not like they're fully formed. Yeah. And it's not like uh, they're, they're already on in control of their abilities or whatever as, as mad scientist or as witch. They're just barely kind of figuring out what they can do and then they meet each other and they're both very insecure and they're in junior high school, which, mm -hmm. you know, some people say high school is hell, but I think actually middle school, junior high school is yeah. hell. Yeah. And so they're just, they're trying to deal with that together and it's, it's, it's not a fun time. So, you know, I, I'm just, uh, the very beginning, page three, a bird talks, <laughs> yeah. right? And we're off into a different world, but the but the the line you have Patricia being more startled that the bird more startled that the bird was refusing her protection than that he was speaking to her. Yeah. So she's somehow quickly accepting that birds talk. Yeah, and you know I think that it's partly because she's like six or something in that chapter. It's she's very young. Yeah. She she's older almost immediately. Like we jump ahead. But when we first, when she first talks to birds, she's like six years old. And th at that age, I remember it being like anything seemed possible. Like if you met a talking bird, you'd just be like, oh, it's a talking bird. Mm -hmm. Like that was right at the edge of like you starting to have a sense of what's really possible and what's not possible. And I, I love kind of playing with that line and like the sense that as you get older, you close in the kind of range of possibility more and more. Yeah. And that kind of happens to these characters, like even though they can talk to birds and do all this other Yeah, they can stuff. even as they get older. Yeah, right? even, but you know, they, they actually get more able to do more stuff, but at the same time, as you get older, your sense of what's possible and what the world is like gets more and more constrained and yeah. you, you kind of get hardened or, or something by life. So you took, you, I mean, you take them as adults or 20-somethings to San Francisco right. where they're very much in the world, right? Yeah. So they're in our world, but all of these things are still in the fantasy world as well. Yeah, and I, I tried to make it as close to like the real San Francisco as I could, and I tried to make it feel not like some kind of like, you know, pastiche of like a fantasy world or like, you know, I love urban fantasy and I love the fact that it can feel grounded in reality. And I think you can do the same thing with like science fiction in the real world. I think it can be really uh -huh. fun to kind of combine those. You get more bang for your buck yeah. having like something fantastical in the real world than you do. You mean just because it's it's even more fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Set up against a, a everyday real life. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. It, it's just it's you know it's more interesting. It stands out more. It it has more power. And then of course, and then you're also taking us into a kind of catastrophic future of climate change, of catastrophe throughout the land. So now you're bringing up really big issues. Yeah, and I think that as I was writing this book, part of what happened was I kept thinking about you know I have a witch 
and a mad scientist, and it's about, you know, it's our, any relationship story is going to be about the differences between the people and the relationship. Right. And, you know, a witch is sort of connected to nature. She has this sort of t deep uh, bond with the natural world. And meanwhile, the mad scientist is all about s technology and the scientific method and empiricism. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like you can't really avoid the fact that in in reality right now we're we're kind of all obsessed with the conflict between nature and technology and like whether we can have both and whether you know we can yeah. preserve the natural world while also having like cars and airplanes and rockets and and computers and everything that we love and so that was something that I kind of and I didn't want to give anybody any answers or you know I didn't want to lecture the reader but I I felt like I could sort of get into that a little bit. But your sense of magic and science coexisting or I mean, connecting somehow? Or? That's, I mean, that's what I hope you come away with in the book yeah. is that, you know, it's not an either or. It's not like, again, I didn't want to lecture anybody, but I feel like if in exploring this relationship, I was kind of finding ways to talk about where these two things meet and how they can communicate. And I feel like it is important for, uh, you know, science and, and uh, you know, nature to, d or, you know, the natural yeah, world to, yeah. to be integrated and, and communicate. I think that that's one of the keys to, to our future. Go back to where you started, because you talked about transcend right. or using different genres right. and kind of transcending them. We do tend to think of genres, right? Yeah. You don't like, I mean, do you, do you not like the fact that we put things in boxes? No, I, I love genres yeah. and I love, I love playing with genres and I, I you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about genres lately because I feel like, you know, real life, you have real life situations that get put into genres all the time. And, you know, to give an example I was thinking about earlier today, you know, on Monday we're going to see two presidential candidates debating and without taking sides, I feel like each of them is going to be trying to present the election and the story of where America is now in different genres. Like, right. is, it, is it a disaster movie? Is it like an Aaron Sorkin uh -huh. drama? You know, is it like, you know, there's different ways of looking at where we are now and they kind of fit into different genres. And I feel like genre actually is super powerful. It shapes how we view the world in real mm -hmm. life. And I think it, you know, it comes from a deep place. But I also think that it can become a box, like you said. It can become something that's constraining rather than, than a way of like freeing up the story. And I think that that's something I'm interested in, is mm -hmm. like, where, what's the difference? And I feel like the main thing is, is just being aware of why you're using a genre, what you're trying to do with it, and, yeah. and how you're, and what kind of story you're actually trying to tell. And not just being like, well, there has to be a ticking clock on page 37 because it's a thriller. Right. There has to be a car chase on page 59. Uh, there has to be like but a you're bunch aware of, of these things as a writer, right? Yeah. I mean, of what, what, what the genre calls for. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, all these years working at io9, which was this website that I worked on about science fiction and science, yeah. uh, you know, I would spend all this time kind of looking at different stories and analyzing them and kind of looking at like how they worked or how they didn't work. And I was always fascinated by how it seemed to me that if you see a good science fiction movie, like one of the ones I think about a lot is Looper, is a yeah. really good time travel movie yeah. because it uses time travel to tell a really interesting personal story right. that actually like has a really powerful ending that all fits together really well. And time travel is there to make the story work. It's not it's not like he was like, it's not like Ryan Johnson was like, I have to do a time travel story. What are the five things that I like about right. time travel stories? I'm going to make sure I, there's got to be a DeLorean. There's got to be like, you know, there's got to be a scene where someone has a chalkboard. Like he didn't think of that. He was like, how can I tell a good story? And like, what, mm -hmm. oh, time travel is a way to tell this story I want to tell. Versus some things where you're like, okay, they just felt like they were boxed in by yeah. the kind of story they were telling. Y you mentioned your, your time at io9. Uh, it's not a world I know, I must say. Right. Where, where, where is the world of science fiction these days? I mean, in terms of what's being written about, who's writing it now, is it, has, how has it changed? I mean, I feel like even just in the time that I was working on io9, science fiction became so much more mainstream. Science fiction and fantasy, I should say. Like, yeah. if you have things like Game of Thrones, and you know, Star Wars has now become bigger mm -hmm. than ever, mm -hmm. and like, and I feel like the real world is so much more like science fiction even than it was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. that I, I feel like it's, it's increasingly difficult to see science fiction as, as the property of any particular group of people or as a particular, you know, 
a, a particular mindset even. Yeah. It's it's just life. It's just the real world. We're we're kind of living in the <laughs> era of science fiction, I think. And that was science like, fiction is the real world. <laughs> yeah, you're telling us, right. huh? Science fiction is reality, and I yeah. feel like that was what was so fun about getting to kind of geek out about it on uh -huh. Nine for so long. Uh huh. And and did your years of working there shape your own writing? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it, yeah. both because I was just geeking out about storytelling all the time, and I got to like have these all these super interesting conversations about mm -hmm. about stuff like genre and how, what it is and why we use it and how it works. Yeah. And also just you know it was just it was a I, it kind of uh, just forced me to absorb so much stuff, so many books, so many movies yeah. that I felt like it was getting a crash course. And it was it was just a lot of fun. And I feel like it, it just kind of pushed me to the next level in terms of like how I thought about storytelling. Yeah. Kind of. Can, can you can you uh, throw out a few interesting examples for our audience or recommendations of, uh, uh, of new books? Of things I've read recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Lovecraft Country by by Matt Ruff, uh, Everfair by Nisi Shaw is a really fun book. Mm -hmm. um, I I just uh, I've just been reading Elizabeth Hand's uh, Generation Loss, which came out a while ago, but mm -hmm. I'm I'm seeing her here at the festival. Yeah. And it's so amazing. It's such a great book. It's mm -hmm. it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a lot of fun and. Uh, you know, in terms of movies, I still really love Ex Machina. Actually, uh, Westworld, which starts on HBO yeah. uh, on October 2nd, is incredible. It's just incredible. They, it's the, the guy who wrote the three Christopher Nolan Batman movies. Right. His brother, Jonathan Nolan, has created this beautiful story about, you know, robots in this theme park who yeah. are basically kind of not just slaves, but just horribly abused. Mm -hmm. And you kind of... I don't know. It's just such a cool, cool story. It's so interesting. And what and and what are you working on? Do you are you working on something now? Yeah, next? I yeah. have another book with yeah. Tor, who published All the Birds in the Sky, mm -hmm. and it's it's very different. It's set on another planet a thousand years from now. I'm really trying to think about like life colonizing another planet and what that mm. would be like mm. and all the tough choices that you'd have to make about like just how we live and what it means to be human when the environment is so different and everything is so you know just you can't you can't just live the same way that you would on earth it's just so different yeah have you figured out how we're going to live then uh, <laughs> i think that part of what's fun about the book is people fighting about it people arguing yeah. about how we're how yeah. What, how to live and what it means to be human. I think that that's yeah. something that I get really excited by. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the new book is All the Birds in the Sky, Charlie Jane Anders. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks for having me. Okay. Pleasure. Fun. Pleasure. Thanks.